Now, if you're able, I invite you to stand as God calls us to worship him from his word. Psalm 34, 8 and now. 8 and 9, would you now hear the gracious call of our God? O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Amen. Please remain standing as we worship the Lord in song. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. together. Yes, Lord, this is your world. You have made it, and you have come in Christ to redeem it. And Lord, we now live under your reign. Oh, Lord, would you receive our praises and magnify your holy name, for you are worthy, and we are blessed to be in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. Um, in his wonderful devotional book, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland, in expounding upon a, a very old Puritan text, explains how, how God, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, with, uh, with holy love and, and holy joy, 
delights infinitely perfect in his forgiving of us. That is to say that God delights more in forgiving us and pardoning us than we delight in being pardoned. God calls us to confess our sins to him because God loves to forgive us. God loves to remind us and to assure us of the reality of Jesus Christ's forgiveness, of his pardoning grace. And so as we worship him this morning, let's go before his throne of grace confessing our sins. Let's remember that we are a part of a family, a body, that we, that we uh, fail one another. We fall short. In, um, in keeping the law of God in word, thought, and deed daily towards one another. And so let's confess our sins corporately as we pray this prayer uh, based on Psalm 5. And then let's go before him silently and individually, remembering that God has the hair on our head counted, that he knows us, that he has called us by name, and indeed he has pardoned us by name. So brothers and sisters, let us worship the Lord together. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Forgive us for our pride and prayerlessness. Forgive us for longing for temporary comfort and material increase rather than a deeper faith in you and dependence upon your grace. Help us to walk humbly before you. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, Lord, would you hear the silent confess confessions of these your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I invite you to stand and to hear good news. God has declared this holy God who cannot be in the presence of sin. God has declared all those who have put their trust in Christ to be pardoned and to have peace with him. Not peace based on how well you have performed nor how well you just confessed your sins, but peace based on the merit of Jesus Christ and your faith in him Hear these assuring words, believe them, and rest in them anew. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. Let's worship him again. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. The sprinkle his soul with the blood of the Lamb, and all pass over Chief feast of sinners. Jesus can say, all he has promised, oh, surely he'll do. Washing the fountain we sinners can bathe, and I'll pass over you. Oh, now I see the blood of my holy wine, my wrath shall be quenched. My judgments be through when I see the blood of my only sign. Yes, I will pass over you. Judgment is coming, all will be there. Each one we see justly is doomed. 
Hiding the saving sin, cleansing blood, and I'll pass over you. When I see the blood of my holy wine, my wrath shall be quenched, my judgments be through. When I see the blood of my only sign, Yes, I will pass over you. Oh, great compassion, oh, boundless love, now crowned with power, Jesus is true. Find peace and shelter under his blood, and I'll pass over you. When I see the blood of my holy wine, my wrath shall be quenched, my judgments be through. When I see the blood of my only sign, Yes, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood of my only sign, yes, I will pass over you. And all God's people said, Amen. You can have your seats. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Greenberg, and I'm one of the elders here uh, at Truth Point, and I get to lead us in pastoral prayer. And I got lost in uh, the song over there in the in the front row, and I just wanted to read the last the last verse uh, for us before we go to the Lord in prayer. O oh, great compassion, O oh, boundless love, now crowned with power, Jesus is true. Find peace and shelter under His blood and I'll pass over you. Let's go to uh, our God with that confidence. O gracious God, we pray to you this morning, our Passover lamb who has sprinkled our souls and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. We are saved from the wrath we so justly deserve, and we're given a righteousness none of us could ever have obtained on our own. We glory in you and in you alone. And Lord, as we have just confessed that we have sinned and failed and doubted your power this week and even this morning, we rest assured in your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We have peace that you never make a promise you will not keep. And you will bring all your sons and daughters to glory. We praise you and thank you that we're able to come and worship you in this place this morning. We thank you for giving us a family in Christ like Truth Point Church to love. Continue to show us that you are all we need. We lift up the rest of the service and the continued preaching of your word. May it honor and glorify you. We receive our gifts today and let them be an expression of how much we are loved by you. Use it to your glory and for your good in the world. And thank you for blessing us so that we have something to give to you. And Lord, bless Lake Osborne Presbyterian Church Use Adam Masterson, their pastor, to boldly proclaim your name today to our sister church. Encourage them as they advance your gospel throughout Lake Worth. We also lift up our missionaries, John and Amy Gordon. We pray for John Gordon's work on completing ordination or the requirements through the PCA. We pray for their family as they plan to move back to the mission field of Panama. We ask that you give them wisdom and guidance. And finally, Father, we close our time of prayer by praying as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He said, but I will be with you, and this, sign, this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Amen. Please stand as we continue to worship. Praise. Amen. Before you have a seat, would you please turn and greet your neighbor with the peace of Christ? If you see someone you don't recognize, please introduce yourself. Start our sermon in a minute or two. Peace. Great work, man. Beautiful. All right, we're going to do the thing where we remain standing. So please return to just in front of your seat, but don't sit down. Brief intro this morning. 
Well, welcome again. It's so good to have you at Truth Point Church. Today is the third week in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Our passage this morning is the first 13 verses of Matthew chapter 2. Uh, this is the second of Matthew's five consecutive portraits of the Lord Jesus specifically coming according to the scriptures. It is quoting uh, the fifth chapter of the prophet Micah, along with this, the fifth chapter of 2 Samuel, where uh, it is promised that the, uh, the ancient shepherd of God's people will come from the city of Bethlehem. Uh, this was, uh, within, uh, just to, to put this within the timeline of Jesus' birth, I know we're a couple months after Advent, so we may not have it all you know, in a grid, mentally speaking, uh, but uh, this is about, about two years, probably, about two years after the Lord Jesus was born in a stall. Uh, in, a, in a manger and la- laid in a manger. It's about two years after the angel of the Lord appeared to those shepherds who were watching, uh, taking care of, of their sheep by night. And uh, apparently the, the young family remained there in Bethlehem until the passage that we come to today. So let's look at this story together, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Brothers and sisters, would you now hear God's holy word? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and came and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever and ever. Let's pray together. Father, during these few moments that we have together, we pray that by your spirit, you would show us the the glory of this child and show us the truth of your gospel. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Please have a seat. The 16th century reformer John Calvin, in his great work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, summarized the Christian life in two words, or one hyphenated word, if you will. Anyone know what it is? Self-denial. Self-denial. He was uh, not a marketer. He was not uh, trying to make Christianity seem winsome to the eye. For this is what he wrote, and I'm quoting. We are not our own. Insofar as you can, let us therefore forget ourselves and all that is ours. Conversely, we are gods, that is, We belong to God, G-O-D apostrophe S. We are gods. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We are gods. Let all the parts of our life accordingly strive toward him. This uh, teaching has shaped much of the church's, we can say, self-understanding over the past 500 years. It was, for example, the inspiration of the Heidelberg Catechism's famous first question and answer, which is worth memorizing as much as any piece of confessional work. Do you know it? What is your only comfort in life and in death? Answer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death 
to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. So beautiful, right? Powerful, worthy of memorization, comforting. And yet, what an utter assault of the idea we are all born believing we belong to ourselves. Either God owns all or he owns none. And our lives should reflect this glorious truth that we belong to the king who owns all things and yet who knows us by name and loves us perfectly. Now, of course we know that uh, without Christ, no one is, uh, no one is free in an absolute sense, all are bound by their sin and enslaved to sin apart from him. We know that. But, but even those of us who, who know the Savior struggle with the idea that, that we control our own destiny. We struggle believing that. We actually believe it at times. Even in our religion, what we, uh, what we seek, uh, what we believe without saying is that we want a, a measured Savior who, who serves us rather than the true Savior and Lord whom we serve, who owns us, to whom we belong. And what Calvin and Heidelberg and indeed all of the scriptures testify to is that, uh, is that only, only God can satisfy the longings of the heart that he gave us. And because we live for him, the Christian life entails Way more often than not, us denying what seems natural and normal in favor of what we believe pleases the Lord, a life of self-denial and obedience. Why? Because we belong to him. Now, why this introduction before this passage? Well, here in this story, we see really uh, dramatically displayed the only two responses in the end that people will have to Jesus Christ. Either worship him or be repulsed by him. That's it. As C.S. Lewis said, Jesus is either a liar or a lunatic and you should treat him as a madman or a demon or else he is the Lord and you fall on your face and call him Lord and, Lord and God. Only two options. And so in this uh, story, this well-known Christmas story in the characters of, of King Herod and the wise men, we see that played out, that people will either see Jesus as the king who threatens everything they are, and so they want nothing to do with him, or they see him as the king who is worthy of everything they are. And that's our outline, just two points this morning. You came on a good morning, two points sermon. It's printed for you in the worship guide if you're taking notes. First, one response to the Lord that he is the king who threatens everything we are. Herod is a central figure in this passage. He is mentioned by name or title in verses 1, 3, 7, 9, and 12, and by action in verses 4 and 9. It is as much a story about him as it is about the wise men. As we discussed during our Advent series, Herod was a violent politician who was very much not Jewish. Uh, Rome had installed him as the highest local official of part of what was previously known as the Kingdom of Israel, and he gave him the title King of Judea, which was the name of that Roman province, Judea. Uh, this account of uh, the ancient historian bears repeating. I shared this a couple months ago. Uh, Caesar Augustus, who was himself uh, a good friend of Herod. He, he'd grown up in the court of Rome with him. He remarkably said, I'd rather be Herod's pig than his son. Why did he say that? Well, because Herod killed a number of his sons, as well as one of his wives. And living in a Jewish area, he may not have killed his pigs. 
By the time of our passage, Herod was a very old man and he was very sick. He was in the last years of his life, which would come to an end within a year or two of this account. And yet still, he was murderous and infanticidal. What we'll see next week and what is foreshadowed in verse 13 is that he will order all of the boys two years of age and younger to be slaughtered in the region of Bethlehem. So threatened that a child was born who would be pursued and worshipped by foreign dignitaries that this dying man who had no love of his own sons would seek to wipe out that generation of the sons of Bethlehem. Herod was truly a monster, but he embodies one of the only two responses to Jesus Christ, a title, as we've said, that is possibly best translated as King Jesus. Jesus Christ is King Jesus. One of the two responses people will have in the end is that you can reject him because he threatens everything you are, and he does. Who you are, my friend, naturally of yourself, Jesus Christ will threaten everything about that. Do you remember the verse in the Gospel of John where it says that from that time on, many of his disciples no longer followed him? Do you remember that? It's a great uh, memory uh, trivia, a piece of biblical trivia. It's John 6, 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. What was the this to which it was referring? Well, just a little earlier, this is what the Lord said. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Now, of course, the Lord Jesus was speaking metaphorically, but what he was saying was that if you want to know me, you must know me as I am. I need to be your life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to life without knowing me. You need to know me as the bread who has come down from heaven, that I will give you life more than food can keep you alive. That is to say, you can't have just part of me. I must be your Lord. I must be your salvation. That was the message that led many people, John tells us, to turn back and no longer walk with Jesus. So Herod was surely monstrous. And to be sure, God is not mocked. Don't want to move on without saying this. Herod is now and will for eternity bear the perfect justice of the holy God for every last one of his sins. Every, every child he slaughtered is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And he will avenge. He will repay. He owns it entirely. But... He had the authority and power to be shielded from the repercussions of his monstrosities in his life. And I think it begs the question for us, to what lengths would we go in order to serve our own desires if we had the power to avoid all consequences? What would we do? Now, as you know, I'm an old youth pastor, emphasize the word old, um, and one of the cottage industries within youth ministry is illustration books. I don't know if this is still the case. Maybe the internet put an end to this. But uh, it was a cottage industry of books that have stories crafted for those who teach students the Bible in captivating ways. Uh, and captivating ways, rather. Um, uh, youth pastor parables, if you will. I remember once reading the story, and this is one of them, of a good and gracious king who required a modest tax in his kingdom to support the costs of necessary tasks. And the, task wa and the tax was one cup of milk per citizen, one cup. This good king did not want to be heavy-handed in any way, even in the collection of the tax. And so he set a great jar outside of the palace gate that once filled to its brim would be the full amount of one cup per citizen. He told the people the day of the collection with plenty of forewarning, and when that day came, all the people from the town happily lined up and poured a cup from their own pitchers into the great jar. Wealthy people were permitted to pay the cup on behalf of the more humble of the kingdom, and some did that very thing. 
And when the day was over, the king's great jar was full. And when it was poured out into the vat that held the government's milk, out poured a town's worth of clean, pure water. Now, what's the point of that illustration? Every single person in that town thought that their single cup of water would not be noticed. They thought there would be no way that their deception would be known. But what they didn't factor into their decision was that within the heart of every man, woman, and child resides the sin that would deny a good and gracious king his due. That is sin. And Herod, the old man dying of disease, was threatened by the report of an infant who was born according to the scriptures. It threatened his throne. And let us, let us understand before we move on that Jesus threatens the throne of every person who wants to live for him. He is the king. The second response available to this king is to see him as the king who is worthy of everything that we are. Now we're going to look at the wise men who traveled by star to meet the infant king. The word we see as wise men in our Bibles is the Greek word magos, with the plural being magoi or magi. The term could include a number of types of people, such as enchanters and sorcerers, but, uh, and, and we get the word magic from this word. But it could also, and we would say from the context, certainly does here include the idea of, of one who is a master of the stars, that is, a studier of astronomy. The identity, the identity of the star that led them to Jerusalem, and uh, then right over where Mary and Jesus were in verse 10, has been much debated. And to be sure, it's a wonderful mystery. Some has, have said that uh, what they saw was Halley's Comet which apparently appeared in that region around the year 12 or 11 BC. Others have said it was the overlapping of the planets Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces, which would have appeared in the year 7 BC. But we don't know uh, what the truth is, but I believe the most likely truth is that the Lord of Heavens had done something singularly phenomenal in the guiding of a star to that very place. We read in Isaiah 40, 26, the Lord is the one who declares, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these, pointing to the stars. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong is in power, not one of them is missing. That is to say, the stars obey his voice. He is the one who made them and guides them. Now, the Magi were, uh, was originally a title of the Persian priestly class. Uh, who advised the kings. They were found all over the Roman Empire in the first century, but especially they were related to Babylonia, which is ancient Mesopotamia or modern-day Iran. It says they came from the east, which biblical, um, which biblical uh, students uh, 2,000 years ago would know that, that that's where the sun rises from. That's where the dawn comes from in the east. Later in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus recalls the promise of Scripture that people from all nations will come to be a part of his covenant people. And he says in Matthew 8 verse 11, I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And so here at the birth of Christ, we see that has already begun. That is, it is already dawning. As foreigners, their search naturally brought them to the capital city of Jerusalem to seek the king. As you know, David was from Bethlehem, but he made his capital city Jerusalem. And like father, like son, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, but he would make his great kingly work in his dying for our sins, being buried for three days and rising triumphantly from the grave from Jerusalem. Looking down at verse 5, after the wise men got to Jerusalem, they inquired of where exactly Christ was to be born. And they were told by the chief priests and scribes, that is the experts in the law in the Old Testament, he would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet. It's interesting that uh, the path of the stars, which again were completely controlled by the Lord, was not sufficient to get them all the way to Jesus. They needed scripture. And the same is true for everyone. General revelation, that is God's creation and his created order, testify in brilliant colors 
but they cannot, but they cannot bring a person to Jesus. For that, we need special revelation. For that, we need the gospel. We need to remember this when we talk to people who don't know him. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so all are without excuse. Everyone you meet has lived every day of his life in God's world, as we sang earlier. This is my Father's world. And yet that knowledge is only enough to condemn them. They need the gospel to be saved. As Paul would go on to say in the book of Romans, chapter 10, how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Moving on. When the wise men finally arrived to the child king, we read in verse 11, they fell down and worshiped him. So overjoyed were they that they acknowledged that this king needed to be praised. And immediately after that, it tells us that part of that praise was to worship him by the giving of an offering. Verse 11, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Of course, they did not give him gifts to earn his favor. They did so, we are told, out of their joy as part of their worship of him. They are in this scene both fulfilling as Gentiles, and being obedient to Psalm 96. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. That is, O families of the Gentiles. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And as no doubt you know, one constant criticism of organized religion in general and of the Christian faith in particular, is the appeal for people's money. How many times have you heard something like this? I have nothing against religion, just don't ask me for money. I don't believe in a God who needs my money. You ever heard that? I think we even uh, naturally, instinctively, feel kind of a, a knee-jerk defensiveness in response. Oh, it's not like that. You don't need to give money to God, but it'd be nice if you did, right? We're insecure about this reality. Before I address that, let me just say, can you imagine if that same metric was used about other spheres of value in the world? I have nothing against my kids. They just better not require money of me. I have nothing against marriage, but it better not cost me anything. It better not demand my money. Now, of course, we don't spend money on our wives and our children in order to make them our family. At least I hope we don't. We do so because they are our family and they're worth it, right? This is but a shabby comparison to what God is doing, my friends. What these wise men recognized is what perhaps is hidden in plain sight of those who would cling to their money in the presence of God. And that is this. Everything belongs to him. Everything. Everything. The great Matthew Henry put it this way, with ourselves we must give up all that we have to Jesus Christ. And if we be sincere in the surrender of ourselves to him, we shall not be unwilling to part with what is dearest to us. Now, I find it remarkably providential that we come to this passage on the same day of our annual congregational meeting at which we present the budget to you and report on the financial condition of the church. I assure you between heaven and earth, before heaven and earth, that I did not plan it this way. I don't have the organizational skills to do so, and even if I did, I wouldn't. And so, my friend, are you faithfully generous to the Lord's work with your money? If not, why not? Normally, we don't give generously to the Lord's work because we're not consistent in our worship of him. It's certainly true what Paul wrote to the young Timothy, that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. That's what he wrote. But what is also true is that we are not gripped by the love of Christ enough, and so we cling to the counterfeit. 
That is, we cling to our money, that which we think will provide us life and security and peace, all of which only can be given by Jesus Christ. We need to worship him truly, for he is the king who is worthy of everything we are. And we need to love him more. As we conclude our time looking at this passage and as we make our way to the table of the Lord, let us see, even here, that the cross lie before the young Jesus. Death is always around him. No, the dying King Herod would not get him. In fact, no one could ever get to him. As John tells us, the Lord would say some 30 years after the events of this passage, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And as Matthew himself will tell us when Peter took his sword and cut off the ear of one of those who was arresting Jesus, the Lord turned to him and said, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? You see, flowing from his vast and immeasurable love. This Jesus, this eternal Son of God, who came in the flesh and now rules from heaven and who owns those who follow him, first he came and he gave his life for them. My friend, he came and he gave his life for you. He has not ransomed us with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was the king who gave everything to make us who we are. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. This is truly, as Calvin and Heidelberg put it, our only comfort in life and in death, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free. What a Savior he is. Believe in him today. Rest in him. Hide in him in life and in death. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you confessing that you are Lord of all, that we do not belong to ourselves, but we belong to you, that you are our maker and you are our redeemer, and you have paid such a price for us. Oh Lord, help us to believe you and help us to find you as you are, more precious than silver, more valuable than gold. Let us lay before you all that is due your name, our praise, our very lives, our talents, our time, and yes, our treasure. And now, Lord, as we approach this table, this table which has been set at such a cost, oh Lord, we pray that you would give us hearts renewed with faith, knowing that you withheld nothing to save us, that you gave your body and your blood that we might be saved. Oh Lord, help us to feast, to feast with hearts of faith on Christ, our Savior. We pray that you would nourish us, for we are weary. We pray that you would grow us in grace, for we doubt, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite our musicians to join me on stage and our uh, communion servers to join me up front. As we make our way to the table, we're going to confess the faith together. This morning, we're going to be confessing the Nicene Creed of the fourth century, this wonderful uh, outline of what the faith that God has delivered unto the saints is. And so let's confess it before heaven and earth together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My friends, that is the true faith that has been revealed to us in Scripture and accomplished in Jesus Christ. And if you are here this morning and you believe that, you have repented of your sins, that you have trusted in Christ for your salvation, that you have become a part of his church by baptism, then my friend, this table is for you. I invite you in a moment to exit your seat uh, to the left, to come forward to take of the bread and the cup, to return to your seat, and then we'll celebrate it together. For this is the meal for all who are a part of God's beloved church. As you make your way here, would you, as we are commanded in Scripture to do, would you examine yourself? Would you, would you discern the body? Would you repent anew? And would you rejoice that Christ truly gave himself for you? He has given this meal to build you up in confidence that Christ truly came. This is the gospel for our senses, as it has been said many times, for the taste, for the touch, for the smell, that Christ really came and died for the sins of sinners like you. Um, as always, we have uh, two options. We have regular bread in the big trays and then gluten-free bread in the little baskets on the table. We also have wine and juice, white grape juice on the outside rings, red wine on the inside rings. But if you're here this morning and you haven't put your trust in Christ, perhaps you're just exploring Christianity. Perhaps you've never been in a church before. Or maybe you've been going to church every Sunday of your life, but you've never believed. If that is you, I want to thank you so much for being here. And I want to assure you that Truth Point is a safe place for you to come and to hear Christ's claims. But I would ask that you would not partake in this meal, for it represents something you don't believe. And the scriptures say it would not do you good. There are some prayers for you printed in the worship guide. Would you please read those and turn to Christ, for he will turn no one away who comes to him trusting in Christ and repenting of their sins. That is the mercy that he has. On the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body given for you. In a similar manner, after the meal was over, our Lord took a cup and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins and is shed for many. My friends, I invite you now to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou Yeah, gracious Lord, where shall I flee? 
Thy mercy seat is open still. What a picture. The mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim. That is where Jesus sat, if you will. And he took all the punishment of the curses that you and I deserve by our breaking of the law so that all that is left for his people is mercy. It is open still. It is open still for you, weary Christian, and he feeds you with his mercy in Christ. The Lord took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the meal was over, our Lord, full of mercy, took the cup and blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember his death and we sing it anew to us every Lord's Day. That because he died, we live. And now I invite you to stand and to sing once again to our God, the God of mercy. For he will hold you fast. Oh 
Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raise with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Again, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Amen. He will hold you fast. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And he sends you out with his name and his blessing upon your head. Would you look up and hear his gracious word? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.